There we go. So hi everyone, my name is Lishoch Ni Khushchila and I'm a PhD researcher in the University of Galway. I'd like to welcome you all today to our online Zoom workshops on decarbonizing research methods. My research personally focuses on Irish language poetry and eco-criticism. I see a few familiar faces here um, from our last week's in-person um, and streamed workshop. So a very warm welcome to everyone um, who was there and a warm welcome to everyone who is new as well today. I would like to thank our sponsors and supporters for these decarbonizing research events, including the Moore Institute in our home university, the University of Galway, as well as the Insight Centre for Data Analytics and the Irish Humanities Alliance. So today we have what promises to be a very fruitful and interesting event, which is both a follow-up and a brand new angle on our last workshop. Some of our aims today are to ask questions like, how do we make our work more sustainable? Whether it be in labs, on desks, in archives, how do we do it collectively, equitably, and as quickly as possible? Coming from my own perspective, dealing with eco-critical literature, it can be hard to face up to the often seeming insurmountable challenge of decarbonizing research. My work is based in theory and close readings, and coming down to the more practical level of things can sometimes seem very difficult. How can I decarbonize my research practices? In many ways, we know what it is we have to do. It can just be quite difficult to figure out how to do things. How can I fly less? How can I procure a more sustainable item for my lab work? How can I ensure that the catering for my event is as sustainable as possible? Therein lies the problem in many ways of individual research. We're very used, I think, to thinking of our work individually and our responsibilities individually as well. And it's, I think it's a big challenge for us to start to think of things in different contexts, collective contexts, for instance, which might help us to make our work more sustainable. We're just not used to thinking in this way about our research at all, however, which was one of the inspirations behind this event, which I organized along with Ashley Cahillan, my co-supervisor. We wanted to bring people together to talk about research methods in a very open and non-judgmental way. Allowing people to talk, allowing people to talk about their interdisciplinary research, allowing people to have their say and exchange ideas. This is an event about opening some doors and looking into what thoughts others from different research backgrounds might have in terms of decarbonizing our research methods. So just to run through the, the day, we're gonna begin with the presentations we will have three speakers chosen on an all-Ireland basis from a variety of fields and experiences who will talk to us about their work for about 10 to 15 minutes each. We invited them to approach the presentation as they saw fit, with an option to present formal research presentation, speculative talk, practical demonstration, whatever they wanted. We will then open up the floor to chat and voice questions and to a wider discussion on decarbonizing research practices. We've scheduled ourselves to be done officially by 3.30 p.m. But if the conversation continues, we, we can keep going on for another few minutes. So I'm going to hand over to my co-organizer, Ashley, here to introduce herself. And just to note as well that I am recording this um, session. So over to you, Ashley. Hi, yeah. Thanks, Lee Shock. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Give a shout if you can't. Um, but welcome, everybody, today. Delighted to have you. My name is Ashley Cahillan and I'm a final year PhD student in the University of Galway. I'm with the English department and my research looks at 21st century novels that address climate change and ecological crisis through the lens of water scarcity. As Lee Shuk said, um, this today is in part a follow up from an event we had streamed and in person last week. Um, we had great conversations at that event. So I'm going to just kind of give a very quick summary of a few things we talked about last week in case you are interested. And obviously I can't cover everything, so I'm just picking out a couple of points. But one of the things that came up is that sustainability needs to be incorporated into research design from the very beginning. So even in the ideas phase of conceptualizing a project, we need to think a bit more about how to make our work sustainable. 
um, and there was talk about incorporating that into funding applications and funding calls as well. And there was acknowledgement among the group that, um, you know, decarbonising research can be easier said than done as well, and that we need widespread and easy access to information, resources and support in order to do that. We have a brilliant sustainability officer here in University of Galway, Michelle O'Dowd. She does amazing work. She's fantastic, um, but she's part time. And um, we talked about how there's scope to have a few more full time sustainability officers here and a fully resourced sustainability office. There was interest amongst the participants in calling for more templates for sustainable research and carbon budgets that could help those who are already interested in making their work more sustainable. Equity was also a big part of our conversation. And it was acknowledged that students or early career researchers might find it harder to speak up and rock the boat in terms of how things are traditionally done. So somebody talked about having a more democratic way of harvesting ideas that people wouldn't feel, would feel their ideas would go somewhere and that they could be genuinely expressive of what they wanted to do and there would be no judgment or negative repercussions in terms of their career or their research. We thought about students or how students or early career researchers might be limited in terms of funds and resources or might feel the pressure of career development targets or research output targets. Um, the, a phrase came from one of our participants. He said, carbon uh, impact is built into career progression in academia. We thought that was really apt and, and important. So I guess yeah equity was really a big part of the conversations and i want to acknowledge in that in terms of thinking about equity for energy transitions for researchers we found the work of a group we found online um the low carbon methods group really helpful because they've been approaching that uh, topic from the position of equity for a while now and i do see amongst our participants i see a few names from that group so we're delighted that you could join us today and um, you're doing fantastic work and we're delighted to have you with us here today um, so those were just a few of the things that came up. Um, of course, there was a lot more. And I do. if anyone who is, is here today, who was here last week, you're welcome to put into the chat a few more things that came up last week, if you do want to share them with the group. Um, so today we hope to build on those conversations and maybe get some new insights and ideas. Um, as outcomes of these sessions, we're going to have a couple of blog posts, one of them being with the Irish Humanities Alliance, who are one of our hosts. Um, we're also are going to send a very brief summary of findings to our University of Galway Sustainability Officer, University of Galway Sustain Sustainability Working Group and the Buildings Office here. And we've talked to people in those offices who are willing to receive those findings. Um, on a slightly separate note, I also want to just say thank you to a few people that we had conversations with in the lead up to these workshops who gave us some brilliant advice um, and support. So that's Dr. Nessa Cronin from Irish Studies in University of Galway, Michelle O'Dowd, our Sustainability Officer, and Dr. Francis Fahey from Geography here. Now, another thing we're trying to achieve with these workshops is productive interdisciplinary dialogue. Decarbonizing research has to happen across all disciplines and career stages. So we need to be able to talk to each other and work together, which isn't always easy when we don't have the same research methods or environments, the same terms of reference, same basic assumptions, resources or conceptual approaches. We have quite an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary group here today. I think we have some people from history, maybe microbiology, math um, geography and other disciplines. And we're hoping that this discussion topic of decarbonizing research is conducive to interdisciplinary conversations. One reason this may be so is that in thinking about the materiality of our research processes and environments, we might get talking in a very basic language and basic terms about our equipment, our environments, our approaches, our basic assumptions, etc. This might help to knock down barriers of communication or expertise that sometimes stop us finding a way to think together. So in the spirit of having a good interdisciplinary conversation, we hope that everyone can be patient and kind with each other and also be curious. So don't be afraid to ask about terms or concepts you don't understand. And don't be afraid to talk speculatively about something if, even if you don't feel like you have, you know, the specialist language or terminology around it. This workshop is about generating ideas and sometimes the best ideas are rudimentary at the start and they develop into something more sophisticated later. In a second, we'll be starting off with the invited presentations. We'd ask that everyone keeps themselves muted during the talks and we'll have Q&A after. And feel free to type questions, comments or observations while our speaker, speakers are talking and we'll read out whatever we can afterwards. Um, 
your comments, they don't have to be direct questions for the speakers. They can just be general observations or observations on our top general topic of decarbonizing research. Write as many comments as you want. That might help the day to be kind of a collective process of idea generation. So that's all for me for now. I want to thank everyone for participating, everyone who's made the sessions possible, and thanks to my co-organizer, Lee Shock. So really looking forward to the chats today. Wonderful. Thanks a million, Ashley. So just a note at this point before we get stuck into the presentations, we give complete and absolute freedom to our invited speakers in terms of how they would actually approach uh, the workshop presentation. Some of them made a formal PowerPoint presentation, some of them have speculative ruminations, some of them might just have anecdotes, whatever works. We wanted to get everyone, give everyone the flexibility to approach this discussion as they saw fit. So our first speaker is John McCann. And John is the Environmental Manager at Queen's University Belfast with responsibility for waste and recycling, transport and travel, biodiversity and staff and student engagement programmes. John is also part of the wider sustainability team that is currently focused on establishing a net zero strategy for the university. So Falchus Shock, John, welcome. Thank you very much indeed, Lee Shock, and also Ashley. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, from the outset, I'm probably the only one here that's not a researcher. So um, I uh, I bow to your greater um, knowledge on like certain um, certain um, topics. But um, I guess where I'm coming from, I sit within um, the estates directorate um, at Queen's. So um, we deal very much with, uh, and then within that, as I said, the sustainability team that encompasses environment, which is my role. It also encompasses energy. Um, so we deal and like the very practical nature of um, trying to decarbonize, trying to reduce our impact, and trying to um, make, uh, aim for net zero. And, uh, and actually sorry, John. Was, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, John, there's a little bit of feedback or something. I wonder, is, this, is there something playing in the background or? No worries. I, I, can everyone hear okay? See, it's, it's okay to go on like that, yeah. This is a wee bit in and out, is it? Okay. No, there's a tiny bit of feedback, but I think it's fine. If, if okay. we can't hear, we'll come in again. Yeah, okay. yeah thanks. thanks. All good. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I sit within, as I said, the sustainability team, and um, we're actually currently in the process of developing a net zero strategy, which will hopefully provide us with a framework and a pathway, um, and ultimately what a lot of people want is a date. Um, where they can work to with regard to their net zero. So um, that's just a wee bit of the background from um, from my own perspective on like where I sit within the team. And like my focus, as you've said there, Vishak covers um, quite a wide and um, diverse range of um, areas. So um, I can start the presentation now if that's okay with yourself. Okay. Lovely. Does that work? Is that better? Looking good. Sound Perfect. clear, hopefully. Oh, man. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, as I was introduced, my name is John McCann, and I sit within the uh, the wider sustainability team here at Queen's University. And the big body of work that's undergoing at the minute is um, with our move towards trying to be um, net zero. Uh, we have recently appointed uh, consultants to work with the university. So um, that we can try and establish a baseline as to what our um, current uh, carbon output is. Um, and then um, obviously a pathway or a strategy uh, that we can then work towards to try and get um, more and uh, like towards net zero. So um, let's see if I can try and produce this. Okay. So um, as I say, Queen's sits um, in Northern Ireland along with, um, uh, we are one of two major universities, uh, the other one being Ulster University. Um, and as I said, our, our focus has been uh, within uh, the sustainability team um, to try and raise the profile of sustainability at the, the university. It's something which didn't always have um, high profile. It was something that was always, um, dare I say it, a nice thing to do. Yeah, um, you know, like the comments would have been, you just, you know, work away there in the background and that's all well and good, but we'll get on like the building the buildings and doing all the important stuff, um, what estates do. But um, 
It certainly has ratcheted up the important list at, at Queen's. It is now an integral part of our Strategy 2030 document, which um, has been recently published by the Vice-Chancellor, which has ingrained in it the um, SDGs. And we have now got a pro-Vice-Chancellor at the university that has got responsibility for sustainability. So to have that level of input, to have that level of, um, I guess, power and influence at like the top table at the university is important. So sustainability, um, in research, we've got infrastructure, travel, supply chain, and also the very important part of like living labs. So just a wee bit more about Queen's, um, for those that aren't familiar with um, uh, where we sit. Um, we uh, sit within um, the south side of uh, Belfast. We are very much um, surrounded by uh, retail, uh, domestic and uh, business neighbours. Um, we're a short walk from uh, Belfast city centre, um, but in total we cover uh, 60 hectares, 85% um, of our buildings um, uh, in one and three um, uh, conservation areas, which has its challenges when it comes then to retrofitting um, improvements in the buildings um, and making any changes to buildings, because we're very much constricted by what we can do. Um, We've also got over 230 individual buildings. We're part of the Russell Group of Universities, which is a very, uh, which focuses on research. And we've got 25,000 students and 4,000 staff, which basically is the size of um, small town. Um, so that's the impact that we're having um, as a university. So our journey um, and the key milestones. Um, where we are now isn't new. Um, we first established our ISO 14001 environmental accreditation back in uh, 2007. Our first real stab at trying to get carbon under control was the Carbon Management Plan, which was launched in 2010. Um, and uh, it was achieved um, in 2018. The reduction in carbon was 21% um, by 2020, and we, and, uh, we actually achieved that by 2018. Um, Throughout that period, we've also worked on, on like a range of uh, topics, such as uh, the, the introduction of uh, several Belfast bikes um, stations on the campus. We achieved, um, we were the first institution or the first employer um, in the UK to get gold accreditation for the cycling uh, friendly employer um, accreditation. We achieved green flag status in 2018. And we also, last year, we were very pleased to introduce um, um, a bike hub to the university. So that's a permanent hub here where staff and students can go and get bikes um, and servicing and get lease bikes um, and uh, to buy secondhand bikes as well. So why is sustainability important to Queen's? Um, well, there's the science. Do you know what I mean? Um, we, there's a clear recognition that we just can't keep going on doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Um, we need to make change. We know the change is needed. It's not without its challenge, um, but it's something that we're committed to doing. Clearly, part of it is also the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which previously I was referencing there is part of our Strategy 2030 document. We have also got UK and Northern Ireland legislation, which commits us to the net zero um, on the Climate Change Act, and also um, the increase in climate awareness within our staff, student and local community. Um, we're seen as a civic university, um, so it's, uh, we're an integral part of um, the fabric within Northern Ireland, so it's something that we very much are aware of our influence on like, what we can do. So Strategy 2030, which I previously re uh, referenced, um, our vision is to conduct leading edge education and research focused on the needs of our society. Um, so there's a commitment to embrace um, the SDGs across all our activities. And I think that's what um, was said at the start of, about not being standalone. You can't just in isolation do something. It has to be across the entire piece of like the university. Um, so research, absolutely. But it also has to be uh, built into the buildings. It also has to be back into the buildings. Um, just, uh, yeah. uh, so... Um, then we've got our net zero carbon journey to date. So as I said there, we've got our carbon reduction strategy in 2010 to 2021. 
um, and we decreased our um, emissions by uh, nearly 23% by 2018. We've released our new strategy document, um, which takes us up to 2030. And as I say, we're now in the middle of trying to develop a new net zero strategy, which will give us a roadmap, which will include and hopefully address scope one, two and three in terms of um, carbon emissions. And the breakdown of emissions um, here at Queen's. So scope one and scope two are the are the, the big energy ones. You've got your gas um, and your, and like your uh, electricity. But as we can see from the pie chart, um, scope three is the main uh, contributor. It's got uh, travel and procurement as well. Um, and it's something which we really need to address. And as I say, it's got its challenges, um, but it's something that we're committed to um, definitely uh, trying to reduce our impact on that sphere as well. And this is what I'm saying about not being in isolation. So I work within the States, but we also got close links with our research and I, our enterprise, our education arm, um, so we also then like what's taught um, to the students at the university and also the social and civic and communication part. So in isolation, um, you, you may think you're doing a good job, but to make an impact, it all has to come together um, to really uh, become more of an ethos across the entire university estate. And collaboration. Um, so what we then do is then engagement across the university community, which is what we're trying to achieve through staff, both academia and professional services, students, also external suppliers, because I think somebody mentioned previously about the supply chain and like how we purchase our, our goods, local residents and local businesses, because as, uh, as I was previously saying about a small town, we, we have got a, a big impact on like uh, what we're doing. So... But there are tensions on the challenges um, around business as usual versus net zero. So teaching and learning, global reputation, research and innovation, all of that would necessitate you going out into the world and trying to um, make people more aware of that. But how can you do that while still reducing your impact? And in there lies the nub and like the challenge to everybody. Um, so in terms of like research in particular, as I said, we've got infrastructure, supply chain, travel, um, and then living labs as well, uh, which is something which I'll, I'll touch on in shortly. So in terms of like um, infrastructure, energy and efficiency in our buildings, we've got renewable and low carbon technology, embedding good design principles like BRIAM Excellent in all our new builds. So uh, and we've got Green Revolving Fund, which is for retrofitting, lighting and um, low energy um, efficiencies across our buildings and also energy efficiency um, equipment. So trying to uh, reduce the impact, particularly those minus 80 freezers in a number of our lab areas. So best practice. So I, pre I previously mentioned like the lab areas. This is a, a real area where we are trying to focus on trying to re uh, reduce our uh, uh, waste. So lab impacts responsible for around 2% of all global plastic waste come from labs. So what we're rolling out now is the LEAF program. And uh, the LEAF program is uh, best practice and is standard for uh, sustainable labs. And LEAF is laboratory efficiency assessment framework and something that we have worked with university and we've adopted from the University College London and is a certification scheme designed to enable staff and students to understand and improve the sustainability and efficiency of their laboratory areas. Um, we um, trialled it last year, a great success, and we're now, uh, the move this year is to get a third of all um, our labs onto the bronze accreditation for LEAF. Just Travel. two minutes, John. Yeah. All right, thank you thanks, very much. No worries. Thanks. Um, travel is clearly a key part. Um, so we've got our travel policy as part of our net zero. And we're also looking at uh, smarter ways of um, to avoid travel, such as our Zoom meeting today you know, and on a future investment in technologies. The supply chain of um, so working with our suppliers to try and make it um, sure that we're uh, trying to procure in the most um, cost effective. Yes, but also um, 
mining of our impact on, on like trying to reduce uh, the carbon emissions related to that as well. And then living labs. So this is a screenshot of what was um, the very early stages of a new building um, up at our school of management, and that's using geothermal technology. So we're taking all our heat from the ground, so ground source heat pumps, um, and that's how that building is going to be, um, as I say, heated going forward. And we are also using various whole um, drilling points across the university to see if this can be expanded upon. Living Labs, so we work with our local NIE uh, company, uh, Northern Ireland Electricity Networks, and will be used to educate students on how um, edu um, electricity is, um, while necessary, um, also uh, transitioning towards a more sustainable, energy efficient infrastructure and grid. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, I realised there was quite a bit in that. Um, I hope we didn't go through it too quick that people couldn't understand it. Um, but hopefully that gives you an insight into uh, what we're doing here at Queen's. And uh, if there's any questions, please let me know. John, that was absolutely fantastic. Really interesting. There's so much we can come back to in that, like the fact that you have a vice chancellor for sustainability, the travel and procurement is a big thing in our university as well. Yep. Um, and I loved the puzzle pieces, the ethos of coming together. We're definitely going to come back to some of those points because this this was the core of our discussion last week too. Yep. Um, right now, we'll come back to the question time after the other speakers, but I'll just hand over to Ashley to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. So our next speaker is Dr. Patrick Bresnahan. So Patrick is a lecturer in the Department of Geography at Maynooth University. He works across the interdisciplinary fields of political ecology, science and technology studies, and the environmental humanities. His research investigates intertwining concerns around water, land and energy in Ireland, and how they speak to broader questions of colonial and post-colonial development. Very excitingly, Patrick has a new book coming out with Bristol University Press in July 2023 that is titled All We Want Is Earth, Land, Labour and Movements Beyond Environmentalism. So, yeah, thanks, Patrick, for joining us and looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Ashley and Lee Shook. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I, um, I don't have a PowerPoint and I also, you know, um, I, I don't have the kinds of you know, detailed and like concrete proposals that John has that were so interesting to hear about. Um, but, you know, hopefully, you know, we, we can maybe talk about some more of that in the Q&A. So I, I thought I'd just start with um, an anecdote and use this anecdote to kind of um, frame my contributions. So uh, this was when I, in my former job uh, in, in a different university to Maynooth where I'm working now, and I was at a, a postgraduate uh, sort of committee meeting and a senior academic um, who had been trying to develop a network with um, the Arctic University, which is this kind of network of universities in the Arctic, but they have non-Arctic partners as well. Um, he suggested that as part of the Masters in Environmental Science, the MSc in Environmental Science that Trinity offered, they would include a field trip component to Svalbard, which is this, um, you know, island in the, in the, 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 the north, uh, and they would carry out research there. And um, the kind of motivation for that was, A, that it was a way of developing this network, but also that it was a way of um, sort of strengthening the kind of appeal of the masters as a selling point for international students, particularly that they'd go, be able to go on this trip to Svalbard, you know, and, and, and be in this place, which I guess is like the forefront of climate science, but also the forefront of climate change. Um, and I, I think that this story, which is just, it's a, it's a one very tiny little anecdote, kind of captures um, three things that I want to talk about. So they've already been raised by Lee and Ashley, and obviously this was core to your previous meeting. So I'm, I kind of apologize if I'm repeating things, but it's pretty no harm repeating too. Um, um, and uh, okay, so the, the, the first thing that I, I think it highlights is that, and John also referenced it there, is that you know, we shouldn't talk about decarbonizing our research methods or decarbonizing the university even if we aren't also talking about the institutional constraints and uh, economic pressures that ultimately shape a lot of what we do and how we do it in the university. 
And I think this is the nub of the problem, is what John re referenced it to in, in one of his former slides. And I think this is important because um, a lot of the focus, at least on my campus, and you see it more broadly in society, particularly in Ireland, I think, is that there is an emphasis on individual actions. And individual actions are very valuable, but they obviously happen within a set of, of often very strong institutional, you know, cultural constraints. Um, and I think that travel, I know that there's lots of ways in which the university contributes to emissions and so on, but travel and the figures that John had were really interesting about travel and procurement are obviously a central one. Um, and travel and mobility has become more and more a part of the university over the last 20 years or so. Um, not just in terms of attracting international students for masters and having these overseas field trips, but I mean, for most of us, it's about travel to present our work for conferences. You know, and that is very much bound up with shifts in the university, which are about measuring our output. It's one of the ways which our manifold, um, you know, activity can be measured is, is how many trips you make to, to what conferences that are kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, more kind of seen as more sort of important or impactful. Um, so it becomes, a, you know, a way to measure things. And that's part of this kind of competition, I guess, this way of, of, of a competition between universities, competition between academics. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I think that, um, the, the, just to sort of, so, so this is the importance of these institutional constraints at the same time, I think it can also be very dangerous to just focus on the institution as this sort of, whatever we want to call it, like a you know, neoliberal university kind of system, the sort of overwhelming, you know, impenetrable, unstoppable, that can be paralyzing. It can lead to cynicism. It can certainly lead to apathy. And so I think the challenge is how can we talk about or focus energy on the institutional constraints rather than individual behavior in a way that can actually mobilize actions? Because I think that some of those actions can be quite small. They don't have to be transforming the entire university in one go. So one little example about this is a teacher class in geographies of waste. There's a lot of effort on in, in the campus in Maynooth from the Green Campus Society and, and Green Society to encourage students to bring heat cups to campus. So this is about reducing plastic. But one of the main places that sells plastic is Starbucks that has the, the, the contract for the cafe. And there's a couple of other shops that also have plastic, you know, Coca-Cola, whatever. You could have a, a campaign which could be a boycott of single use plastics on the campus. So that's not about changing the entire university system. It's quite a targeted campaign that would lead to some kind of college having to take some kind of action, a mandate, which could maybe lead to further discussions about procurement. So I'm not saying that's easy. I'm just saying it's a different way to challenge, a challenge, a, a, a channel energy. So it's not individual. It's about the institutional conditions that then allow all of us to sort of act differently. So that's the first point about institutional constraints. So the second one, um, that it kind of raised that anecdote is about equity. And this was raised by Lishuk in the introduction already, um, and Ashley. And so that's this very tricky one about who has the privilege to travel, including slow travel, which is, a, 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 you know, one of the suggestions that I see proposals to take trains, for example, if you're going to Europe rather than uh, flying, and who has the privilege not to travel. Um, so we can think about that masters again, it's going to be expensive, that field trip, it's going to be for that cost is either going to be borne by the students, or it's going to be borne by funding, which is taken from somewhere else in the university. So it's a question of, of resources and who has them, and where do they go. But I think with travel for conferences, again, can think about how early career researchers either don't have the funding, like Ashley said, but also are under much more um, pressure to travel that it's necessary for them to uh, disseminate their work, but also to network if they want to get a job, if they want to meet people and open up doors, all of that stuff that you're encouraged to do actively as an early career researcher. Whereas you have more senior academics that don't have as much of a need to travel. Um, and they are often the ones who can decide whether they want to travel or not. And because these things don't have as much ramifications or implications. So I think that those questions about, um, and we can also think about global, you know, inequalities about, you know, people accessing funds, parts of the global South, having to travel fur further to sort of, um, sort of, uh, uh, high profile conferences or whatever. But so this question again, which applies to wider society is about who has more responsibility to decarbonize who has the privilege to decarbonize and who doesn't have that privilege. 
those questions, how, how do we foreground those questions in all of these discussions or debates about decarbonization? So that gets to the third point, which is once you start raising those questions, you are going to not necessarily ruffle feathers, but you're going to confront questions of power um, effectively. So back to that anecdote, I was a, a, you know, I didn't have, I was on a fixed term contract at the time. I raised the point in the meeting that it seemed a bit hypocritical to have a master's in environmental science if you're flying them to Svalbard, which is effectively melting because of uh, emissions. And um, the response was that this type of field work was essential for environmental scientists, that it was an important part of their training. And I looked at other people in that room to support me, and there wasn't much support, even though I felt that they probably felt that, yeah, there was something to talk about. And I couldn't, I didn't feel that I could push it further. So that is a, a very tiny example of that experience of where, you know, if we are going to push these things and talk about these things, uh, you know, there are power dynamics. And then that raises the question of who should be leading on these things. And very often, as in this case with Lee Shook and, and Ashley, it is uh, earlier career researchers. And I, I don't know, you know, the rest of the participants, but I do think that there is a real importance and onus that it is senior academics that are, are, are taking these, these, you know, leading on these kinds of campaigns and these discussions when they become antagonistic uh, in, in, in the ways which I think that they will if they're going in the right direction. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there. And um, uh, yeah, hopefully we can come back to some of that stuff in the discussion. Perfect. Thanks a million, Patrick. That was fantastic. And a lot of what you're saying is really at the core of kind of the ideas behind the workshop, what we talked about last week and what we talked about with other people when we were in the lead up to these workshops. So it's really important to kind of emphasize those points and it's brilliant to get that perspective from Manuth as well and from yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting today, there is a bit more emphasis from yourself and John in this kind of global competition between universities and even this kind of you know, I guess between researchers thinking about their global profile and their global network, that's actually coming up a little bit more today, I think, than it was last week, unless I'm missing mm. something, which is interesting considering our Zoom session, which it is open to a more international audience. Um, but yeah, so definitely really important to think about. Thanks so much, Patrick. Patrick. So I'll hand you back to Lee Shuck, um, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Wonderful. So our final speaker for today is Tanya O'Brien. And Tanya is joining us from our own Institute of University of Galway. Tanya is a PhD researcher, part of the Mechanobiology and Medical Device Research Group at the University of Galway. This is a research group led by Professor Alicia McNamara, working to discover how mechanobiology processes contribute to bone development and osteoporosis. Tanya is also an ambassador for My Green Lab. And My Green Lab is a global nonprofit organization committed to creating a culture of sustainability through science. So really looking forward to Tanya's presentation, which I will now share. Thanks, Leisha and Ashley. No worries. Yeah, so as Leisha said, my name is Tanya. So I'm in my second year of the PhD, which focuses on developing humanized mechanobiological models of osteoporosis. And I'm under the supervision of Professor Leisha McNamara. So in addition to this, I'm spearheading lab greening for the biomedical engineering department at the University of Galway. So uh, the biomedical engineering lab is at the start of its green lab journey. And today I'm going to talk to you about why we felt it was necessary for us to change and as well as going through the main behavioral and practical methods we have adopted so far. So hopefully this will be of benefit to you, uh, those of you who are considering making the transition towards more greener research. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what are we uh, actually trying to achieve by becoming Green Lab certified? So in brief, we're aiming to reduce the environmental impact of our lab use. So in order to achieve this, we've partnered with My Green Lab, a nonprofit organization based in California, uh, whose philosophy is to support and encourage the sustainability of scientific research. To, so to assist labs uh, 
in this transition towards sustainable best practice, My Green Lab have outlined 12 topics which are applicable to us, and they broadly relate to energy, waste, water, green chemistry, materials and engagement. And through tackling each of these topics, then we can facilitate behavioural change. Um, but how does this actually even relate to us as climate, uh, uh, how does climate change relate to us as researchers in Galway? Next slide, please. Uh, well, firstly, labs are really uh, intensively resource bases. So energy intensive equipment means that lab consumes 10 times more um, energy than office spaces. Then water is used in everything from autoclaves to washing glassware, and that's just the tap water. So most labs like ours also use deionization. So adding all of that together, labs consume four times more uh, water than office spaces. And then there's waste. So a recent letter in Nature estimated that labs generate 544 million kilograms of plastic waste a year. And most of that either goes to landfill or it's burned. So to put that in context, that's enough plastic waste to cover all of Galway City reaching up to your shins. Uh, next slide, please. So additionally, we can feel the effects of climate change happening right here and now. So if you're like me and think it definitely didn't used to rain this much in Galway when I was younger, it's because you're right. So national rainfall has increased by 5% from 1981 to 2010. And to make matters worse, then the temperature has increased nearly by one degree since 1900. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, additionally, on top of that, we have many obligations to fulfil. So the 2015 UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change saw Ireland agreeing to reducing our environmental impact, which led to Ireland's uh, Climate Action and Low Carbon Bill 2021. So depicted here in the middle of the slide are the 2030 targets. And then finally, on the right hand side of the of the slide, you can see the University of Galway's sustainability strategy. Um, this outlines how all labs on campus will be green lab certified by 2025. Uh, this is in addition to a 10 percent reduction in water and greenhouse gas emissions and a 45 percent reduction in energy consumption throughout the campus. Uh, you can click next, please. So all of the strategies outlined aim to limit the rise of the Earth's surface temperature to less than two degrees, as the current trajectory which we're on will be de detrimental to all life on Earth, and especially those other one trillion uh, species we, sh we share the world with. Next slide, please. Um, so where are we now in our Green Lab journey? Well, the baseline of BME has been assessed and we've implemented the changes suggested to us by My Green Lab. So we're currently on our way to stage three, which is certification. Um, this, of course, didn't happen overnight. Uh, so in order to make the changes towards sustainability, I was joined by other uh, research group members and they joined me in, in creating the green team. Next slide, please. Uh, so the green team is divided into five broad themes, water, waste, energy, consumables and green chemistry. And the purpose of each theme and its members is to guide everyone in the lab to adopt greener lab practices. So um, collectively, it was important that every research group working within BME was represented at least once. So this was just used to encourage more cohesiveness in the lab as a whole. So the next number of slides give you an examples of what areas the lab had to tackle in order to become more sustainable. Next slide, please. Um, so looking at energy first, in general, we're all aware that, you know, after use lights and equipment should be turned off. But it's a little bit different in the lab where some, uh, some equipment should never be turned off and others only occasionally. So for that reason, I designed a set of traffic light system stickers, which can be found on all the equipment and light switches. And they're color coded um, according to their demand of use. So on top of that, we need to look as well how to optimize the number of equipment uh, in the lab and share this amongst other researchers. So next slide, please. So still on the topic of energy, uh, we're moving on to fume hoods. So fume hoods are used to protect lab users when they open and then use uh, toxic chemicals. So in general, any equipment with a heating, cooling element, or even one that uses a vacuum are really big energy consumers. And it's certainly true of fume hoods. They use an average of three and a half homes worth of energy every day. So we also used, used to use fume hoods to store chemicals. It should never be the case. So it not only poses a health risk, but it also negatively impacts the extraction performance of the hood. But luckily, there's many uh, simple ways in which we could alter our behavior. 
such as shutting the sash when the hood is not in use. So the, the sash sticker that you see at the bottom there were designed to remind users to do that. And in doing so, we saved a 50% of our energy consumption. Next slide, please. So the energy consumed by cold storage units uh, in the lab was also very high with the ultra low minus 80 degree temperature freezers guzzling up the most amount of energy and emitting a large amount of CO2. So to add to this, then samples were often stored here unnecessarily. They were forgotten about, which then increased the risk of ice buildup. So we improved upon this by um, clearing out and itemizing the minus 80 and then maintaining an up-to-date inventory which was accessible to all users. Uh, we also perform um, a weekly de-icing and are in the process of increasing the temperature to minus 70 degrees. Just by increasing it by 10 degrees will save about 40 percent of energy a year. So additionally we found it useful uh, for each user to look at samples and assess whether they actually need to be stored at such a low temperature. So for example DNA samples are actually stable at minus 20 for two years so it was worth checking um, if samples needed to be stored in a less energy intensive manner. Next slide please. But it's not just um, the lab equipment we need to be mindful of to save energy. Uh, we can look at our desks and, uh, and uh, offices too. So computers, printers and photocopiers, they're turned off at the power source when not in use. And also we started to uh, discourage the use of screen savers and instead we set the computer to power saving mode after about five or ten minutes. Um, and something I learned, there's also scope for energy saving when purchasing new computers. And something to be aware of, if not already, is that laptops use a lot less energy uh, than PCs. So following on from energy, then the next theme is water. Next slide, please. So we use an awful lot of water in the lab between washing glassware and all sorts of equipment to deionization, which is particularly use, uh, wasteful. So it uses up to three times as much water than what has been produced. But by installing aerators, just these little cheap attachments to the tap, uh, it saves water without losing water pressure and only turning on the water bath shortly before we need it and consolidating the autoclave use by following a weekly schedule uh, and only using it and running it when it's full, we can continue to make a lot of uh, major improvements on our water use. Next slide, please. So green chemistry was the next theme, and it's of huge importance to lab sustainability. So when we use a better experimental design and follow the 12 principles of green chemistry, uh, our chemical process uh, produces a greener outcome. So we also approved upon our methods of chemical disposal by educating ourselves with regards to the 12 principles. Uh, just to note, there are many online resources which enable you to choose less hazardous uh, and toxic chemicals. It can be a bit daunting, but there, there's a list of them listed at the end of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and it was great because Ireland and the University of Galway moved towards more inclusive recycling. So this means that all plastic other than polystyrene and mixed are now actually recyclable. So it's easier for everyone to segregate their waste. And the posters seen here were developed and designed and they're available in the lab. So it just helps uh, lab users segregate their waste more easily. Next slide, please. So uh, coming to the last of the green team themes, that's a tongue twister, is the purchasing and consumables. So there's lots of ways um, to improve upon ordering methods, such as looking for uh, sustainable alternatives and checking if the items actually contain sustainable labels then before buying. Also, uh, we learned by consolidating our orders with other research groups, it actually reduced the frequency and the environmental impact of our actions. Uh, to give you an idea of the amount of plastic consumables of one uh, biomedical engineering research group pre-COVID. You can just take a look at the graph there on the left hand side. So pre-COVID at that time PET wasn't even being recycled, whereas now every um, bar you can see here other than the polystyrene six and then the other seven can be recycled. Next slide please. So finally, um, by thinking sustainability both within the lab and the outer community, we begin to appreciate that by education and then by publicizing what we're doing here, we encourage and inspire other labs and communities to undertake the same process, thereby forming an infinite loop of sustainable actions. Next slide, please. 
So as promised, there's a list of useful resources which you may like to take a closer look at. So particularly the educational resources from My Green Lab Ambassador Programme and the SEAI uh, Energy Academy course are very worthwhile if you want to learn more about lab sustainability or sustainability in business or even in the household. Uh, you get rewarded then with certificates of completion, so it's a win-win. Um, so thanks everyone for listening. Uh, next slide, please. And um, I look forward to hearing your comments and any questions you might have. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Tanya. Really interesting there to see how, again, like there's this emphasis on collective actions, on a team, on everyone doing their bits and like separate and like the duties and things like that. I thought it was really quite fascinating. I think someone, Deirdre, in the chat mentions there, that the traffic light system is really good. I think that's actually a fantastic idea. And it reminds me of um, something I'm going to try and bring up in a sec. It was, um, I think it was Maastricht University and they had like a flow chart system for like how to travel. I'll try to bring that up when we open the discussion, um, which we're going to do now. So if guys, you want to stick up your hand or ask a question or put it in the chat, we're opening up the floor ask questions, make comments, whatever you want to do. There's a lot to talk about there. There's a lot of things. Um, everyone had a different approach for the presentation there, which is really interesting and fascinating to see the differences. Um, so I'm looking forward to this discussion. I see Deirdre has her hand up. Uh, I do. Yeah. Fair play to everybody. That was very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, there's so many different questions, but just something that occurred to me um, is when we're talking about the senior positions in universities and the optics that we're seeing now in respect of sustainability, um, I'd love to see, like you'd get a job title, but I always follow the money. I'd love to see how much money each of them it's like if you had to rank them you know they're always talking about the rankings if they had to rank them in terms of their uh spend on staff time to help affect these things and i don't just mean the mouthpieces i mean the likes of sustainability offices like we know in galway it's a 0.5 position part-time i'm assuming it's 0.5 but it's a part-time position so we know the price that's being put on this ambition so i wonder is there a uh, has that been traced or mapped? Does anybody know how much uh, they're all investing? Because when we look at how much is coming from government, it occurs to me that, um, you know, sometimes they like to measure how much might be invested according to performance. And that performance could be, you know, in respect of student numbers or something like that. Well, how's about having some sort of measurement of performance in respect of sustainability with actual um measurable uh, outcomes in, in terms of the reductions that we, we've seen cited uh, to date. So there's my question. Fantastic. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, I wonder, do, that, do any of our speakers want to come in? And no worries if you don't. Anyone can kind of really come in and respond to that if they want. Anyone in the room? <laughs> I think, actually, um, I'd maybe come out of ETS first. Um, yep. um, uh, I know what it's like working with in the area that I worked and um as I said during what I was saying like really feel as if like you're you know pushing water up a hill you know like mm -hmm. you're not really getting any buy-in um you're not really getting any traction in the senior elements uh, within the university um uh, the net zero agenda here at Queen's um is something which as I say because it's it's really like the students in many ways have come to the university and said, listen, like you need to be setting the date on this. They've been driving the agenda. Um, so, uh, and tied in with that, there's the uh, government targets as well. So we have had to um, look and, as I say, a lot of people, um, rather than just put out a date, which I know speaking with universities across the UK, they'll all oh, listen, we're going to be doing this by this date and this by this date but like when you ask how are you going to do it mm. not really sure yet do you know what I mean so rather than put a date out we would rather go through the process that we're going through at the minute to try and get a strategy and a pathway to go to net zero and but in line with that the university recognised the need to invest in it and that's where I think 
uh, Deirdre was saying about, you know, being putting money behind, like it's all very well, put some uh, document and it's going on a shelf and that you're know, gathering dust. They actually invested. So as I said, we have now got um, a pro vice chancellor with responsibility for sustainability. Mm -hmm. My colleague, Sarah, um, um, there was a new role created. She is the head of sustainability. That's her job, mm. period. You know, she's on that meh, more than 37 hours a week. You know what I mean? Mm. She's, you know what I mean? So she's directly liaison with the pro vice chancellor. There, um, as I say, she's looking, or like she's got responsibility for the team that includes environment and energy. Um, and she's also very closely liaison with um, engagement with both staff and students. So I guess to answer the question, yes, it absolutely needs investment. We were trying to get investment for years and it was like every year we would bring a paper to a management committee and, oh yeah, wonderful work. Yeah, keep it up, keep it up. And that was it, you know what I mean? Like there was, like, there was nothing really, you know, yeah, but like we need to do more. Yeah, yeah, but we're spending 50 million trying to put up this library or we're spending this time, you know what I mean? Like there just wasn't, whereas, um, but now there's a clear recognition um, and it's actually filtered into, I don't know if it's the same um, uh, in the Republic where you would get um, um, our local government departments are now been challenged to make carbon savings. Mm. And whereas previously our local department for infrastructure would have been, oh, listen, about putting in, it's always a hot topic, putting in cycle lanes or putting in safer routes to university or like whatever it is. They're now very much, how can, they, how can mm. this influence the carbon or clean air corridors in mm. towns and cities? You know what I mean? So like you don't have your car build up. So um, definitely it's become a, a bigger topic. Um, but I guess to come back to the point is for your institution, who like whichever institution it is, um, it has to invest in it. Do you know what I mean? It, it, and, and to be seen to be hitting... You know, I mean, if if you want to get to net zero or if you aspire to be net zero, um, how do you get there? Mm. It, it requires investment. Um, yeah. I think that's really, really interesting to consider that um, because Deirdre was there at our last um, meeting last Friday. And one of the big things that came up was that our university doesn't have any full time people whatsoever. Um, like we have Michelle O'Dowd, who's fantastic. She's part time. She's got a lot to deal with. Um, so having that kind of that finance and behind these positions, behind these roles in order to support everyone else is really important. I'm going to go to Katrina now because Katrina has her hand up. I'll just ask Katrina. Am I on mute? No, you're, you're okay, okay now. I'm okay now. Okay, sorry, I just hit the wrong button. Um, just to pick up on what Patrick presented there. So I'm in mm. UCC, I'm in the Department of German, which is part of the School of um, Languages, Literatures and Cultures. And I really appreciated the anecdote about locking travel into what we're doing with our students. So if you're teaching in a languages department, you have this problem because you have to send your students abroad to have language immersion. And that's how students have always learned and various experiments during the pandemic to do virtual reality language immersion. It just doesn't work. Language is embodied and the learning that happens in a languages degree, part of it has to happen in what's called the target culture. And that's always presented a problem to me. I was at a university in the UK for a long time and I was the green champion in my school and that really was just a box ticking very junior exercise I would go around putting stickers on lights which is great you know insofar as it went but it wasn't taken very seriously at that time I think the conversations moved on I think this workshop and, and what's being presented here is a testament to that but I still have the problem that you know certain disciplines maybe more than others are locked into travel and so what I try to do with my students is historicize that you know so I studied at TCD. My uh, doctoral supervisor, he was in German studies. He was speaking German fluently, having learned it, started learning it at 12 and then gone on to be a scholar in the discipline. There were no cheap flights in his day. He was doing all of his travel mm. and slow travel. And so it's about reactivating those possibilities or we go back even further in time, world literature. That was already a topic in the 18th century, you know, so that, that this kind of um, 
pressure that we're all under to demonstrate our internationalization credentials, we need to recouple that conversation and, and that sort of world openness, as they call it here in my university, with decarbonisation. And I think this is really, really helpful to, to bring that anecdote up. And I suppose what I'm wondering is how we do it. So what happens now is that our students go abroad, partly because of the digital revolution and the mainstreaming of English as a global language, they don't get the same immersion, they get homesick, and they book a cheap flight home at Halloween. Mm -hmm. And so it's something about sensitizing people to what travel means and how travel can actually sometimes be deleterious to, to the learning outcomes that you're trying to pursue and how slow travel could actually bring about more positive learning outcomes. And I think that's a conversation we're still far from starting in languages. So if anyone has any tips, I'd be very grateful. Brilliant. Thanks, Katrina. Great point. Um, I don't know, Patrick, did you want to come in on that a bit more or well, talk to yourself? Uh, I might just say something very small about it, which is that I don't know where the, this uh, workshop and the um, I saw that Deirdre mentioned the document of recommendations. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about the IRC as the main research funding body and about when you apply for funding and it's, you know, the, the term Katrina used there was locked in. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost expected that you apply in the dissemination section, that you're going to apply for travel funding to as far away as possible for like uh, certainly a North American conference, maybe like a couple in Europe. And you don't even think about it. You don't mm -hmm. even have So there's something about the format of that um, application that encourages a certain relationship to travel and dissemination. So maybe there could be, because it's not a university thing, that's about the research funding body. I know they've started to add in boxes of like, how are you going to take emissions into account? I know the EPA does that, a bit like, you know, with other things to do with gender diversity. But I wonder if there's a way in which, you know, again, that's an institutional constraint. There could be something changed in that application that would actually make it harder or you'd have to justify it more, or it would give you more funding if you disseminated your research using different forms of travel or you did it more local. You know, obviously that's a big ask, but I think it would be worth putting down on a document yeah. of recommendations. Thanks, Patrick. That, that to, that, yeah. Well, it's just an observation that um, something like this is already happening uh, with uh, the funding um, infrastructure that's available to the arts uh, and uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Cathy Fitzgerald down in Carlo, she's an artist and a PhD as well, who was looking at the question of sustainability um, in art and specifically was collaborating with Carlo County Council to help make it the first um, local authority or any authority in this country to actually build these kinds of sustainability uh, lines into the uh, funding uh, structures based on um, work that was already happening in Scotland. So, um, you know, in, in other fields and other funding competitions, as I say, in, in the arts, they're having the same conversations and she's been at the forefront of it in this jurisdiction. So um, maybe there are learnings to be had there for this uh, conversation. I, I want to uh, thank everybody and congratulate everybody involved with this project because since the first workshop we had, what was it, last week, week before? Yeah. Last um, I went back to a budget and I added in in a sh very panicked um, kind of rush. If I'd had more time, I could have given it even more time. But I added a line for a, a sustainability audit. I had to give it a line or something and, and mm. put it in there. I said, well, at least it's in year one that there's, it, it was an effort to acknowledge there's a cost involved in ensuring that the research, that the design of the whole you know, five-year project Mm -hmm. has sustainability built in from the start. I don't know what it go it's going to look like, but at least I tried with something in the budget to allow for that um, contribution mm -hmm. into the research design, as um, Vincent said last week, at the start, at the design mm -hmm. phase. But as I say, just to, um, what Patrick's talking about there, it's already uh, happening and w it's keeping conversations like these alive that help yeah. uh, keep it, um, keep the momentum going. Exactly. And, um, you know, it, it was really interesting. Um, Whenever I filled an IRC um, postgraduate application last year, like, you know, you have your, your ethics questions. For anyone who's international, that's kind of like the national funding for science and humanities um, at the postdoc and postgrad level. Um, but I filled the postgrad one. There was no question on sustainability whatsoever. Um, there was ethics and gender and things like that, but there was no sustainability question. Um, in terms of the equity, which a few people have mentioned, you could make an argument that, well, you could start building it in at the higher level 
or even like, of course, you should mention it in the earlier ones, but then as it goes on, the weight of that question should be greater. If mm-hmm. we consider like people who are more established should maybe travel less, whereas people who are less established and have to build up their profile should have the opportunity to travel more. But that's a whole other kettle of fish. But it's really interesting, Deirdre, that you just built that in and we're like, okay, it's going on. Now, I'm actually going to turn to Riona here because the case is Riona, Capham. Can you hear me? Just about, Riona. Okay, is that better? That's better, yeah. Okay, sorry, I have no camera. Um, I'm just picking up on, on those two points by Patrick and Deirdre and Deirdre Safleisha about the IRC applications and how that can be in some ways um, a way to uh, prompt people to think about it. And um, Leisha is aware of this. I, am, I have an IRC um, laureate at the minute. And one of the things I did um, was, you, you know, I, it's expected, I suppose, no more than the travel. It's also expected that there will be an online output, you know, some sort of database or digital component. And um, when I was looking at um, putting together a website, I looked at, you know, were there um, companies in Ireland who uh, produce websites that have sustainability to the forefront? And um, at that time, just the way it was with procurement, I, I had an opportunity to um, work with one such company uh, in Burr, County Offaly. Uh, they're Ireland's leading eco printers. Um, but those sort of small, you know, indications of how important and how sustainability, I suppose, from the humanities, sometimes it mightn't be as obvious how we could do it, uh, you know, because we generally don't have labs and so forth. But those sort of um, prompts in applications at all levels, you know, um, I think would be very helpful. And it's, it's more, you know, it's beyond the institution. I think it's more of a national focus. The other thing, just when I do have um, the mic, that I just like to raise, and again, um, given that we were, you know, uh, encouraged to speak openly, even if it's beyond our area of expertise, this is something that I, I'd really like to to hear more about if anybody can, uh, can expand on it. But it strikes me that in a lot of our... Um, a university strategies and so forth. The UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals are embedded and we're encouraged to embed them into our um, teaching and research. And I'd really love if there was more a ro- more robust um, conversation around those actual sustainability development goals. Like what sort of development? Is it another form of capitalism? You know, um, I-, I think the humanities might be an area where this really... This could be where we could lead on this and see, you know, are we, in a sense, um, signing up to something that's just perpetuating um, the huge inequalities, uh, you know, between North and South and in different areas? And what does it really mean um, to, to align your teaching or your research with sustainable development goals? Should we not perhaps critique those goals or critique the type of development that's being um, encouraged. Now, as I said, that's not my area of expertise, but it's something that I, I, I just have a sense that it's something that we should um, engage with. Mm. That's a wonderful contribution. Thanks so much, Rena. Like that's very important because um, I do. I, I don't know. I don't know too much about it either. But I do. It does seem to be a little bit that in some people you can just kind of pick a sustainable development goal and align your research project with it without actually explaining too much how you actually are doing that. I don't know if that is the case, but it kind of seems to be a little bit like that. But I do think humanity's perspective on those SDGs are really important. So that's brilliant, Riona. Thanks. Um, I see Katrina, you, sorry, actually, did anybody want to respond to what Riona said first, if you want to? It is on that as well. So, Oh yeah, go for it, Katrina. <laughs> Just really briefly, thank you so much, Riona. I, I can't see you, but it, it, you're speaking to my heart. Next week, UCC, whose president is a real champion of the SDGs, and he's doing a massive, you know, he's, he's um, spearheading this whole campaign to get the SDGs really embedded and mainstreamed in every aspect of the university. So I've been given a two minute slot to talk about how we do this in the eco humanities. And so what I've chosen to do, and you were allowed two minutes and one slide. (laughs) And so I've put sustainable development goal number eight, which is decent work and economic growth, which has the icon of an upward arrow. 
and I'm mapping this on to the hockey stick graphs, which show how Earth system trends map on to socioeconomic trends since in the age of the Great Acceleration, to show that they're all going in the same direction and that that direction is the direction we need to not be going in. And so through the, uh, and, uh, so the humanities-based analysis of iconography, of rhetorics of growth, of narratives of progress, we can start to dismantle even some of the assumptions at the heart of the SDGs, because I, that I very much share your concern with the mainstreaming of SDGs, given what they contain and what they can kind of cloak. So thank you for that. Mm. Thanks a million, Katrina. Um, I actually do have a question for Tanya as well, if you don't mind. And again, I'm kind of going out of my areas of expertise as a humanities um, scholar. So it was brilliant to learn about um, the work that's going on with the Green Labs, um, Tanya. I'm sorry, I'm just going to make sure, Tanya, are you still here with us? Actually, I am still here, yeah. Oh, you are? Still sorry, here. I thought we lost you. <laughs> sorry. Um, so I guess I, I'm just wondering a little bit in terms of like your process as a green team, like, you know, is it enjoyable to work as the green team? Does it kind of add a bit more to your workload or does it, do you, did you feel like you had good like kind of guidance and infrastructures and resources in place to kind of do the work that you've been doing? Um, and as, has, so has it been kind of beneficial for you as researchers and as workers or has it been a bit of extra work? Um, yeah, well, um, I think it was mentioned before, but um, I suppose the, the first thing that we we wanted to do was get the, um, you know, we'll say PIs or professors on board. You know, once we got mm -hmm. them on board, it was much easier then uh, to get the students on board. Um, in regards to the green team, um, it can be, I suppose it's just more work in the sense that there's more meetings and things like that. But generally with, um, we'll say the designing and things like that, that was something that I kind of, I wanted to do myself anyway and get that on board so we could um, kind of pitch it, um, kind of our plan to the PIs um, before we went and, and did anything further. Um, but it is enjoyable overall because you can see like there there is a massive kind of uh, change in the way people think, even how mm -hmm. they're working in the lab even with chemicals we'll say with regards to the green chemistry you know it's 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 actually quite simple you know um initially we were all kind of it, it's quite daunting to think oh i have to change everything now and it's not going to end up the same way but it does and mm. even looking at um there is sustainable kind of um products there all there is generally alternatives other than we'll say with the tissue culture flask there isn't but everything else like there is a sustainable alternative so we even have that kind of on our purchasing um kind of on teams it's on microsoft teams just to look okay well if i'm ordering this for common say like if it's a pipette or something i can actually order this other pipette you know mm -hmm. it was it was uh, made using less wa water and everything like that recyclable materials so i suppose there is um yeah it is overall it, it definitely more enjoyable um th than what you think after the initial kind of um being being kind of daunted um yeah no it is more enjoyable and the more you the more you learn and the more you develop it um the easier it becomes as well yeah i think it's really interesting for humanities scholars like ourselves to kind of, to, to see that kind of tangible change a lot because like it came up as well in john's presentation too like you can see the dates and the times and the progress and things actually changing measurably which is fantastic because i think Sometimes with humanities, it's a little bit harder to trace the tangible changes that we can make. So really interesting to, to get that perspective as well. Now, I just, someone had their hand up there, but before I go to the next person, I think, was it Patrick had their hand up or Kate had their hand up first? Did you have a question, Patrick? I didn't have a question. It was just a response. Okay, uh, yeah. sure. Go on ahead. So, and then I'll I'll share something towards the end. But no rush. Work away. Thanks. It was just to the the the, the discussion about the SDGs. Uh, Rena and Katrina had talked about, and it's something very similar in Maynooth as what Katrina described in Cork, where the UN SDGs are being very much pushed uh, by a new president, and um, you know, being embedded into teaching and so on. And I think that that you know what uh, Katrina was talking about there is a very important part of this decarbonization of the university, which is that there are all sorts of struggles over, over knowledge, basically, over, you know, how we, you know, use concepts of, of which disciplines get priority of all of those things, which have long been part of politics, but which we should also be paying attention to. Like, it's not just about reducing our emissions. It's not just about making things more sustainable in certain ways. I think that there are all sorts of battles happening within the university over, 
you know, growth, degrowth, the meaning of sustainability. And I think we need to be involved in those as well. So that was that point. And then the second one, which is kind of related, is that a bit like the SDGs, but also quite a lot of the discourse around sustainability and decarbonization is quite technical and technocratic. So I was wondering if we could talk, and uh, Tanya's example of the lab is a good example of like, what kinds of discourses or practices do we develop that are about um, sort of making these things more popular, of, of, of mobilizing people, of the student body particularly. Like my sense is that the student body are kind of left out of this stuff. They're just seen as people who should be made more aware, educated, to take less single-use plastics, the same way that like citizens are seen. And I, I, as opposed to thinking about how they can become, you know, the, 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 the actors, the, the kind of agents of change. And that seems to be a very very difficult, but really important. Because as long as it's just at this level of measuring things and bringing in sort of technical changes, I, I don't think we're going to get very far. So. Mm. That's a really interesting point, um, Patrick. Um, I'll just, uh, there's so many things I want to respond to, but I'll just go to Kate, because I just want to give Kate a chance to get her uh, their, their question or comment in. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm I'm a PhD candidate from Vancouver, Canada, and I'm involved in Ann Pasek's uh, Low Carbon Research Methods Group. And through that, I've been lucky to be um, carrying on some discussions with um, scholars and activists and artists who are interested in lowering carbon in their practice, but discussing where that might be and exploring it. And a surprise has been the interest from librarians specifically. Mm. So they, uh, a librarian who showed up to one of these discussions uh, described um, themselves as a proxy consumer. And I was really taken by Tanya's presentation wondering like what else can be a lab? These are ecologies within larger ecologies within larger ecologies, but libraries specifically are capable of facilitating discussions that help people explore um, where carbon is and, and all of those areas that they might not be offered space to consider. So I'm curious if anybody is aware, the librarians want to know how they could have something like this Green Lab certification. Um, and I'm wondering if anybody is aware of anything that's out there. That's a great point, Kate. Uh, thanks a million. And absolutely, that's why we're delighted to have had you in here, Tanya, to talk to us to kind of yeah, I guess show what you're doing and then see if we can expand it and adapt it for our own research environments. Mm. Um, I wonder, does anybody want to respond to Kate? And if not, then we can go to Gabrielle. But does anybody want to respond to Kate? So Emily has just, Emily Park has posted into the chat here, a tangible goal that humanities researchers can look to is data center energy usage. I believe the information tech and infrastructure sector contributes up to 2% of carbon emissions, which is not insignificant. And Caroline has just posted a question in, but I'll go to Gabrielle first and then come back to Caroline then. Hi everyone, uh, I'm joining you from Montreal, Canada, and I'm kind of picking up on something that Kate actually just mentioned there about libraries. And I think that is tied to archives as well. Um, having done a master's of library science here in Montreal, I was kind of struck by uh, how little the curriculum involved any aspect of sustainability with respect to how to archive for longevity. Um, and then emerging from that program and becoming a PhD re researcher, I had my own set of demands with respect to how I could make my own archival practice more sustainable. And it struck me that there was kind of a lack of overlap. Um, and I think picking up on some of the comments before, but where the humanities might kind of come in in a cross-sectoral or interdisciplinary kind of partnership to bring kind of some of these conversations to what is seen really as a professional degree, a terminal degree. You take the classes you have to take to be able to do whatever your, uh, you know, whatever the needs may be. But I think sometimes, uh, like in the case of the university where I attended, wanting to take classes that were seen as more kind of um, rounded and kind of uh, framing my thinking as opposed to providing you with specific technical skill sets were seen as superfluous. And so I think, you know, all these things overlap in terms of pedagogy and curriculum and not just archives within universities, but without, and of course, libraries as well. Some of the most radical people I know are librarians. It's fantastic. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to bring up um, archives probably as contributing to this conversation with libraries as well. Mm -hmm. I'll just let 
Emily come in and then I'll go to Caroline in the chat and Brian because I, I think Emily might have something very relevant to say to this. Yeah, so I actually um, work as a uh, as a librarian at a university of uh, Purdue Fort Wayne in the United States. And I, I'm actually very interested in this conversation and where librarians can contribute. One of the one of the um, one of the recommended articles um, ended with a, a researcher saying that we need to demand uh, sustainability and decarbonization from our libraries and our archives. And I don't think we actually need to demand it. I think librarians are out there asking uh, to be partners to to help um, you know contribute to the decarbonization of research, especially as far as um, travel is concerned. We, as Barry mentioned last week in the in the um, in the workshop, librarians are delighted to provide access to their to their research via non-travel methods, via interlibrary loan, via digitization. And I think one of the things that I'm very interested in, in doing research as far as uh, library and information and, and science is concerned in the academy is to get librarians who have a tendency to work in their silos in the, in the archives. And one of the things I'm proposing to do is to talk about this particular workshop that I've attended at the um, ACRL conference next spring. Um, ACRL stands for uh, um, Association of, of uh, College and Research Libraries. And what I'd like to do is, is to present the, the work that is being done in these types of uh, workshops all over the world and maybe incorporating a little bit more on both sides, a little bit more of a um, collaborative mindset on both mm -hmm. part of the academy at large as well as the libraries that serve those academies. Wonderful. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run over to the chat here because there's a, quite a few comments being put in. So I'm gonna read out Brian's comment, which is really interesting. Um, and then I'm gonna ask Caroline's question. So Brian said, I think ethics across research is where this discussion needs to occur. Yeah, well, that's come up a lot. I think, you know, like these ethics things, you know, sustainability, gender, environment. So low energy blockchain developments are supported uh, are celebrated but aren't they supporting a new form of energy coloni colonialism really interesting computational grids that analyze materials reactions are a hot area but how much energy do these methods require where in universities does the discussion occur between the left hand and the right hand on ethics and brian goes on to say libraries are the original circular economy i think and they need to grow in relation to the materials and methods that they support that is a really interesting point i think because there's a lot of talk about digital, like coming from humanities, digital humanities, making things open access, making things searchable online. But a lot of the time, speaking from our own context, that isn't always happening. Like the infrastructure, the support just isn't there to make these things accessible. We're actually conducting this workshop from our homes right now because our internet access in the university is quite patchy and unreliable. So if you, you're not addressing like the very baseline things, um, you know, how can we make these things? How can we ensure that these libraries and these um, activities can grow in relation, as Brian said, to the methods and materials that they do have the potential to support? Now, we'll come back to that. We, like you could just even have this whole conversation about archives. That's how interesting it is in libraries. But Caroline posted a question a while ago. Uh, Tanya, can I ask what the extra workload is like for you and the other members of the green team in biomedical engineering? Do you all meet regularly? Are the meetings relatively informal? Um, yeah, so the workload, uh, the work, the workload initially was, um, I suppose, quite a lot. And actually, one of the most frustrating things about um, getting people involved in that is um, people say, that they want to be involved but then when it comes to it getting you know things done you know sometimes that's not the case or you know i suppose it's a lot of the students there and researchers they're you know working long hours they're on these projects you know that's their initial thought so to think of changing their behavior it's also something you know it's something extra that they have to think of so it's trying to get people um kind of involved or to to change their habits initially mm -hmm. Um, so generally, yeah, the meetings are, are very, they're quite informal. Um, sometimes we pitched 
um, would say like we have a lab meeting every week um, and you know maybe every second of those lab meetings we'll say something about sustainability um, you know if, if it's regards we'll say like fume hoods we'll say oh we've noticed you know things are being stored in the fume hoods again can people stop doing that or you know no change their behavior again so I mean there is um, initially there's a lot of uh, there is a heavy workload but as it goes then it gets easier and as more people I suppose get involved and do the work then there's less for people to do overall mm. absolutely fascinating no we're going to close up in a few minutes now i see john has his hand raised sorry i might just say if it's okay because we did say to everyone half three so we might just officially close but we're happy for to stay around for a few minutes after just in case people have to go so very quickly thanks everybody mm -hmm. for participating and speaking thanks our, to our host more institute insight center and irish humanities alliance We'll keep you up. There's going to be blog posts and a quick list of recommendations to offices and University of Galway. So that was a really quick um, thanks for anyone who does need to go, but we're happy to, mm -hmm. to stick around. Thanks. <laughs>